Hello, everybody. I want to talk about molecular dynamic simulations and then also Monte Carlo simulations. Um, there's nothing in your textbook on this, so I stole this uh, set of slides from Ron Dwar at Stanford University, and this is a lecture that he gave for his um, computational biology class this past October. Um, it's a good topic because it ties together a lot of the ideas that we've had um, in quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics and then talks about how do you really do calculations for macroscopic systems for many molecules, which we haven't, we couldn't do, you know, in quantum mechanics at all. So let's um, go through the, um, briefly the outline. So we're going to talk about the basic idea, which will involve the equations of motion. We'll look at some of the properties of molecular dynamic simulations and some applications. Limitations, I'll skip this stuff, and then we'll talk about Monte Carlo simulations, which is a very different way of um, doing uh, the uh, simulation with molecules. So the basic idea is atoms in real life are moving around um, given the potential that they feel in their surroundings. Um, so if you think about it as kind of a landscape, if you had, say, an atom in a system if it's in, if it's feeling a push from the surrounding atoms, that's like being on top of a hill, and it'll be pushed away um, until it's not feeling as much of a push, right? So it's like going from the top of a mountain to the bottom of a valley. Um, so how do we figure out what those pushes are so that the atoms and then the molecules will end up in uh, the positions that they would end up in? And we'll find out later they don't just sit there. It's, it's a dynamic system. So the basic algorithm is um, in a computer, basically, you have something that's a time step, and that time step might be just a few femtoseconds. Um, and what you do at a given moment in time is you look at where all the atoms are. So in the computer, you actually just have a list of x, y, and z coordinates for all the atoms in the system. Some of them are probably parts of molecules. Maybe all of them are parts of molecules. But then you can calculate the force that they're feeling by the surrounding atoms. And that'll depend on if, you know, if they're ions, then you use Coulomb's law. Um, if they're nonpolar, then you'll use uh, Van der Waals interaction, which we use um, something called a, um, a Leonard-Jones potential to model. But anyway, we have, we have some function uh, that's basically given the distance separating two atoms, um, what potential does it feel? And then you can calculate the force based on um, that position, and then you'll update the position uh, using uh, the velocity that the particle had and the acceleration. Let's say a little bit more about that. Um, I'll find a movie. This one doesn't work in the slideshow because this is just a PDF, but I'll find a movie and put that on Moodle. All right, so. Equations of motion. We know Newton's law is just force equals mass times acceleration. We also know, and we talked a little bit about this when we talked about the harmonic oscillator, that force at a given position x is going to be equal to the negative derivative of the potential energy function. So like for a harmonic oscillator, that's you end up with Hooke's law. Um, but again, this potential energy function, it's like part of the Hamiltonian, um, and it's just based on the surrounding atoms. All right, and then we know that velocity is derivative of position. Acceleration is derivative of velocity. Um, so here's velocity, derivative of position. This is acceleration. We also know that acceleration is force divided by mass. So then we can rearrange these equations and basically, we're going to say, okay, a new position will be equal to the old position plus some delta time times what the velocity was at the old position. Also, the new velocity will be the old velocity plus some delta time times the old acceleration, where acceleration is force divided by mass. So you're constantly, you'll, you have a, a list of positions and a list of velocities and you're constantly updating these on a per femtosecond basis. So what the computer has to do is it goes through your whole list and it just cranks forward and updates all the positions, adding on this little 
delta t times v, and it updates all of the velocities for the next run. And then since you have a new position, now you're going to have a new potential and because the, the force will depend on the position and etc. So you just keep iterating. Okay. Um, in reality, um, it doesn't go quite that well if you do it that way. Um, you actually base your velocity on like um, your velocity half a step ago and half in the future and then that makes it um, more more accurate but you don't need to to really understand that all right so key properties you find out when you look at the movie that the atoms are always in motion because it's not like everything is going to come to a minimum energy and then just stop. That would be like zero temperature. They always have enough energy, enough momentum to kind of overshoot the minimum and then wiggle back and forth. And, and think of this wiggling back and forth as, you know, many atoms and many wells and they're all interacting and wiggling. Um, given enough time, you do end up with the Boltzmann distribution, which is awesome um, that we, we end up coming back to that just following Newton's laws. Um, there is a, a wrinkle, so energy should be conserved with Newton's laws. And it would be if our time step was infinitely small. But our time step is not infinitely small, it's discrete. So then what happens is, say, as two atoms are approaching each other, if you give a finite time step, they end up getting closer than they would. Like they would have turned around and gone back but as they're approaching each other, they'll get closer than they would have if you had an infinitely small uh, time step. So then what happens is you, you're constantly adding a little bit of energy whenever two things collide with each other. And so the energy tends to go up with time. So what we do in simulations then is we look every 10,000 time steps or something at the, the square of all of the velocities, which is proportional to the temperature, and we just multiply through all of them by some number less than one, maybe 0.995 or whatever it needs to be to bring the temperature back to the temperature that we have it set at. The physical analog here is like if you have your system tied to a temperature bath to keep the temperature constant in your system. All right, um, you can't ignore the solvent. We don't need to get into this too much. Um, sample application. So if you're designing a drug, maybe you have an active site and you can have these things wiggling and then see if the drug comes in here and if it docks well, if it fits. And this is something that drawers published on in Nature. Um, similar applications here, uh, folding of a protein could be done. You can think of the protein, you know, interacting with the solvent and coming together. Generally, this is not the best way. It doesn't work that well. Um, Proteins are just too big and folding takes too long, basically. Um, limitations, it's mostly about time scales. So if each time step is a femtosecond, then you need trillions of time steps to get to a lot of physical phenomenon like folding a protein. Um, so it's pretty limited, especially for large systems. Now you can imagine if you have a tiny system, then you can do you know, trillions of time steps. But if you have a large system, updating that list of, you know, thousands of atoms positions is going to take a long time. All right. And I'm going to skip some stuff here. And then let's talk about Monte Carlo simulations. So Monte Carlo simulations are very different from molecular dynamics, but you end up... Um, having the same results um, that is a Boltzmann distribution. So Monte Carlo is this city um, that has a lot of casinos in it and um, the rolling of the dice gives you random numbers and Monte Carlo simulations use random numbers in order to generate uh, new configurations. So what you do is you take all of the atoms positions and you move them all by a given delta x, delta y, delta z and the size of your delta x, y, z you tune uh, to a certain amount, um, a certain range, but within that range you use random numbers to determine how far things move. 
So there's no time in a Monte Carlo simulation. Things just move randomly to a new position, and then you decide whether or not to accept the new position based on the Boltzmann distribution. So here's the idea. We know we want a Boltzmann distribution in the end anyway, because that's the physical distribution. So if the new position reduces the internal energy, then we just accept it. If it increases the internal energy, then we will still maybe accept it, but we compare it to the Boltzmann factor. So e to the negative change in energy divided by kT. And so we accept it with that probability. And if you do this, um, then you end up with a Boltzmann distribution of positions. So Monte Carlo simulations um, are really good, especially um, if you have like a barrier, a kinetic barrier um, in your system that you can't get over, it would take too long to get over, then you can just sample on the other side of that barrier um, by, ex by uh, having your, your random moves explore both sides of the barrier and then you can accept with probability still whether you get there or not. And so Monte Carlo simulations are better um, for exploring things that would otherwise be kinetically limited. All right, that's it for today. Um, like I said, uh, no problem set on this material, but we'll have a couple of questions on the final.